you in India and good afternoon here in Australia. Namaste, namaskaram. My name is uh, Jim Burgess. I'm the National Chair of the Australia India Business Council. And it's my pleasure today to moderate this very important webinar. Can I start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land we have gathered here on today in every part of our nation here in Australia. I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging for they hold the memories, the traditions, the culture and hopes of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples across our nation here in Australia. Now the Australia India Business Council is very, very uh, happy to host this webinar, uh, which is um, sponsored by the Victorian Institute of Technology on this very important topic of the critical role of the regulator in promoting higher education to meet the needs of the Australian economy and community. The Australia India Business Council was founded to foster bilateral relationships between the two countries. We're the only premier not-for-profit organization with a mission to promote trade dialogue between India and Australia through nurturing and maintaining close relationships in both Australia and India. Indeed, we thrive on business-to-business -business relationships. The AIBC is a national membership organization with active chapters in Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane, Perth, and Canberra, and maintains close relationships with the federal and state government agencies, diplomatic corps, and industry bodies. So without further ado, I'd like to call on the Queensland president of the AIBC to take us through today's webinar and, and, and welcome us. Over to Nick Senapath, and you can see his very uh, impressive profile on the screen. And in addition to his role in, in AIBC, he's also the chair of, of the Federation of India's India Chamber of Commerce and Industry in both Australia and New Zealand. Over to you, Nick. Thank you, Jim, and uh, welcome to everybody to this webinar where we will be discussing the critical role of the regulator in promoting higher education to meet the needs of the Australian economy and community. The topic is an important one as leaders and regulators actively work through what the future of higher education should look like locally and globally as one of Australia's flagship export sectors and one that one of our panelists, Peter Varghese's report, uh, emphasized as the, as the sector that binds all the other sectors together. Uh, a big thank you to our sponsors, the Victorian Institute of Technology and Arjun for making this webinar possible. The loss of international students in 2020 due to COVID has created unprecedented challenges. And right now there is a need for clarity and pathways for our regulators and leaders to, uh, to show us the way. Today we have a fantastic group of panelists who Jim will introduce. We also have senior leaders, leaders within our audience, including our Queensland Vice Chancellors, Professor McKinsey and Professor Bartlett, and also the UQ uh, Pro Vice Chancellor, Dool McDonald. We are also pleased to have uh, Gitesh Agarwal from the, who's the Commissioner for TIQ Trade and Investment Queensland, who joins us from Bangalore who is a strong supporter of the Australian-India relationship. We also have close to 200 live participants. So the session runs for about 75 minutes and Jim usually keeps us pretty well on time there. Our panelists will provide their insights and there will be an opportunity for questions and answers. You are welcome to share your questions using the question section in Zoom. And if you don't get, and if we don't get to every question, we will follow up uh, post this session. So thank you all for attending and let me hand over to Jim who will moderate today's webinar. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Nick, for that very good um, introduction. 
And it's now my pleasure to introduce uh, Peter Burgess, um, AO, who is the Chancellor of the University of Queensland. And you can see from uh, Peter's very impressive CV that he has been a High Commissioner to India as well as the Secretary of DFAT and has played a, a really very uh, innovative role and a very great policy thinking role in promoting the bilateral relationship between Australia and India and driving it forward. So over to you, Peter Verghese. Thank you very much, uh, Jim, and greetings to all of our participants in uh, India and Australia. And Jim, can I thank um, AIBC for the opportunity to participate in uh, this panel discussion today and also for the work that um, the Council does to promote uh, particularly the education relationship but the broader business relationship. Um, I wanted in my um, opening comments to focus on three issues. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the intersection of regulation and international education, which is the core theme of, um, of the webinar. Um, but I also want to talk a little bit about the room for growth in the India-Australia education partnership um, and then uh, offer some more speculative comments about the uh, impact of COVID on uh, international strategies uh, from Australian universities. Um, and I should say at the outset for that, for the most part, my comments are personal comments. They're not uh, reflecting a University of Queensland position. Um, they're informed by the work I've done on the India economic strategy and on other areas of the bilateral relationship. Um, so let me start with um, uh, regulation and uh, the international education sector. Um, as, a, as a broad comment, you know, regulation and economic philosophy tend to be joined at the hip because <clears throat> the degree of regulation that you impose on any particular sector, I think, is very closely linked to your views on the role of government and how interventionist governments should be in particular sectors of the economy. And that role tends to wax and wane over time within countries, and it certainly is quite diverse um, from country to country. Um, there's probably an inevitable tension uh, between a sector and its regulator. Um, I think this varies sector by sector. I mean, for those of us who were watching closely the Royal Commission into the financial services sector, you could see that those points of tension between the regulator and the sector at times were quite acute. Um, I think the university sector looks a little bit different because for the most part, um, our experience has been uh, a pretty constructive relationship between the sector and uh, the regulator. And I think that reflects um, a couple of factors. The first is the concept of autonomy, which is so central to the idea of a university in Australia, still largely frames the regulatory environment in which we operate. Um, and I think that gives it a special character that you won't necessarily find in uh, other sectors. Um, secondly, I think there's been a history of fairly close consultation between universities and the regulator and overall a pretty light touch approach to regulation in Australia, although Alistair may, um, may, may have a slightly different perspective on that. And that light touch is, is partly the nature of um, the sector and it's partly perhaps also the limited regulatory resources that uh, TEXA as a regulator has to, uh, has to work with. Um, and then I think a third factor why the regulatory relationship in the university sector is, is reasonably constructive is that we're a relatively uniform sector um, the university sector tends not to be 
very diverse in its structure or in its offerings. Um, and as Glenn Davis, the former Vice Chancellor of Melbourne famously said, Australia has one university with 39 campuses. And that tends to make the work of a regulator, um, I think, um, um, a little bit easier. Now, in terms of international education, um, I think the single most important role that the regulator plays is ensuring quality and ensuring that standards are high. Because while there are many reasons why international students might choose to come to Australia for an education, um, I think fundamental to our attractiveness to prospective international students is and must remain the quality of our universities. So Texas role uh, as a custodian of quality and a reviewer and monitor of quality, I think is, uh, is very important. Um, and being able to point to a regulator with credibility and expertise um, as an independent um, perspective on the question of quality, I think is fundamental to the way in which Australia positions itself in the international education sector. So I think for, for, for us uh, within the university sector, the, the, the issue really isn't whether the regulator is currently working well, because I think by and large it is, and I think that's probably Texas own self-evaluation but rather whether we're on the cusp of a more intrusive regulatory regime down the track. And there are some signs that we may be moving in that direction. I mean, I think regulation is the new black in Australia and, and in some other economies. Um, and that is not unlinked to the rising uh, interest in a more interventionist position in the economy by the state. I think in Australia, the culture wars have um, expanded the regulatory remit, and this is likely to be deepened. And I'm thinking here about a possible regula a regulatory role for freedom of expression and academic freedom. Um, so I think it's worth watching whether this trend does in fact pan out and obviously what the compliance costs and burdens on institutions would be, because you know, that's always a significant factor in the way in which universities should run. So that's what I essentially want to say by way of the regulator. In terms of the Australia-India education relationship, um, my report um, characterized it as the flagship of the bilateral trade and economic relationship. That remains my view. Um, I think it's uh, important that we try and build this relationship. Uh, I think it's particularly important that we seek constantly to move up the quality curve in terms of um, uh, Australia as a destination for Indian students. In other words, we, we want to have a, 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 an education relationship which draws on the best of the best in both of our countries. And that means, I think, deepening the understanding in India of the quality of Australian education and likewise deepening the understanding in Australia of what India can contribute to an education partnership. I think a key part of focusing more on quality is to focus more on research and a key part of focusing more on research is to give more emphasis to postgraduate um, uh, links between the two countries and research collaborations. So. Um, there are things that we should be doing. Uh, universities have their own way of doing it. My own university has entered into a partnership with Delhi IIT for joint PhDs. That's just one example. Uh, they are many others. A couple of quick words on <clears throat> the implications of, um, of COVID. Um, I think generally COVID is an accelerator of trends rather than a creator of a new reality. And I think we'll see that in the education sector and, and in international education as well. Um, and um, what I think we, we do need to uh, focus on is the way in which India will, uh, I think, strengthen the diversification strategies that COVID has highlighted. 
So as we seek to decrease our dependence on a single market in China, I think the case for India grows. I think uh, COVID is going to put a focus on new methods of delivery. So we've all had to very hurriedly move to online. Will this re represent a structural change in the way in which we deliver yeah. education and where will the regulator stand on uh, a greater online presence uh, in um, Australian uh, degrees and postgraduate qualifications. Um, I think the experience of international students on our campuses is something that we will need to focus more in the post COVID environment. I think it's very important that we do everything we can to ensure that our international students have a genuinely integrated experience on an Australian campus, that there isn't a ghettoization effect of international students on the campus. And I think it's hugely important that we ensure that domestic and international students have a, uh, an easy and a, <coughs> a constructive um, relationship. And we need to nip in the bud any prospect or any signs of a pushback against international students, whether it be related to concerns about <coughs> how group work is distributed or English language standards. And again, these are all things that the regulator uh, will need to focus on. So, uh, Jim, let me let me just conclude with a couple of, of very quick thoughts, because I think I'm knocking on the door of my 10 minutes. Um, I think, uh, firstly, effective regulation uh, of quality is fundamental to our international education strategies. Um, and uh, I know that TEXA is very conscious of that. Secondly, as operating models evolve, and I think operating models will revolve, uh, will evolve more rapidly post COVID than they might otherwise have, um, we're all going to have to adapt. And that means that the regulator itself is going to have to adapt to those um, differing um, operating models. How much regulation is too much will continue to be a challenge for the sector. Uh, but the trend seems to be in the direction of more, not less. And I'll be interested in, in what Alistair thinks about that. And that comes with pluses and minuses, I think, for the sector. Um, education, in my view, will be central to the future of the Australia-India relationship, but we have to see it as a two-way street. This is not about just getting as many Indian students into Australia as possible. This is about building a long-term partnership that serves the national interests of both our countries. Um, and finally, I'd just say that um, we need to be open to new forms of collaboration. And I think the national education policy that India has announced will open up more space for collaboration with foreign providers uh, and will lead to uh, different models uh, evolving over time. How far that goes will depend in part on um, where the politics of opening up the Indian education sector ends um, and what's allowable and what's not allowable, but clearly we are going to be looking at different delivery forms. So I'll, I'll stop there, thanks. Thanks very much, Peter, for that very um, um, comprehensive presentation and, and it's given us uh, a lot of provocative thinking, particularly in relation to the effective regulation of quality, the new operating models and how much regulation is less or more and the long-term partnership and, and what a, a good introduction to our next speaker, speaker uh, and that's of course Alistair McLean, who is the Chief Executive Officer of Texa. And you can see from uh, Alistair's profile, he has a very, very impressive profile. Um, and we're very fortunate to have um, a regulator and a CEO that has that broad experience, uh, both in government and in, and in the diplomatic corps, and of course, with the university. So over to you, Alistair, and thanks very much for joining us in this webinar. Well, thank you very much, Jim, for your kind introduction. Um, I'm delighted to be able to present to you today. Um, I thought uh, today would be an opportunity to outline Texas' role in promoting higher education uh, and meeting the needs of the Australian economy and community, uh, particularly this year in responding to the uh, challenges posed by the COVID-19 pandemic um, and around ongoing and substantive issues such as academic integrity. 
Um, as has been already pointed out, higher education is uh, a critical part of the Australian economy. It's our largest service-based export and it supports jobs and communities across the nation. Last year, um, international education contributed some $37.5 billion to the Australian economy uh, and higher education making up almost half of all international enrolments here in Australia. Um, Texas' purpose um, as the regulator for the higher education sector is to protect the student interests and the reputation of the sector. And we do this um, in a number of ways. Firstly, we quality assure and regulate the sector in as timely, transparent and risk-based a manner as we can. Um, we support higher education providers um, to deliver their products and offerings we protect student interests and we enhance, uh, you know, our purpose is also to enhance the reputation and competitiveness, competitiveness of the sector. Um, part of that is in providing advice and information to inform decisions about the quality and the appropriateness of higher education offerings. And then of course we take, or we, we endeavor to take prompt and effective action to address substantial risks to students or the reputation of the sector. Um, our approach during the COVID, the advent of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic this year uh, hopefully provides some example of uh, the responsiveness of a um, regulator um, in, in quite dynamic circumstances. Of course, it, it required us to rapidly shift our, our focus and approach. Um, in March, you know, with the onset of the pandemic, um, we relaxed the national code to enable online teaching to international students, both onshore here in Australia and offshore. And that was critical in allowing international students within the country to continue their studies. But it also allowed those students who were in their home country and couldn't get to Australia um, due to border closures to continue enrolling and studying um, uh, uh, with Australian providers. Uh, that change in the national code helped retain international students. It supported the higher education providers and the wider economy. And it provided a pathway for students to come on board uh, or come on, on shore once the borders reopen um, and hopefully to the benefit of both them and to the communities that they come back to. Um, we, also were required, of course, to respond to the federal government's higher education relief package, which was announced, I think, in April. And that included funding to deliver undergraduate and graduate certificates. Um, these are shorter courses in a range of um, priority areas, such as health and information technology. Um, and um, those areas were identified in the relief package as essential for meeting the challenges posed by the pandemic to the economy, et cetera. And we expedited the accreditation of those courses to get them to the students um, who were enrolling. Um, we did a number of other things to reduce the regulatory burden. Um, we extended the periods for registration of providers, because that's one of our key functions, and for accreditation of the courses that they offer. We also uh, waived fees and charges um, and we refunded that those that had already been paid and, and extended the application timeline. So that was, a, a, if you like, a, a financial um, relief, part of the financial relief package to the sector, and in particular for the smaller not-for-profit and for-profit providers that, um, that uh, constitute a large number of our providers, um, a large proportion of our providers. Um, we also supported the sector in the rapid transition to online learning. Peter referred earlier to the pandemic driving um, or, or processes or, or, or changes that are already occurring across the sector and online learning, of course, is an important part of that. Um, and we worked with a, a range of experts to develop a suite of online and good practice resources for providers and that helped them, um, we think. And that's certainly been the feedback to improve their online delivery and, and support a better student experience. Um, on that, we've studied the impact of that rapid shift, if you like, to online learning or through online learning. And we've analyzed the student experience from surveys from about 120 institutions in Australia. 
Um, and we found that while some students enjoyed the additional flexibility and appreciated the effort to continue um, um, studying, others reported issues with information technology, reduced interactions with academics and peers, feelings of isolation and reduced motivation, difficulty with the translation of some subject areas from um, physical to online delivery, et cetera. And that, they're not unexpected or, or unusual impacts, but um, it was interesting to see just the extent to which they occurred. Um, and our work, I think, is it's given a, a good basis to assist providers to address those impacts and continuing to develop their online learning offerings um, through 2021. Um, finally, we've also worked with India, um, our international partners, I mean, including in India, to share good practice and our expertise, uh, particularly as we move to consider the challenges of digital and blended modes of delivery, both during and then hopefully after the pandemic, sooner rather than later. Um, a couple of other key activities. Um, I know that Jim will be winding me up soon. Um, academic integrity continues to be a key priority for the agency. Um, Parliament, you know, the, the Commonwealth Parliament in Australia has just passed new anti-commercial academic cheating legislation. And those new laws will help protect the sector from the threat posed by contract cheating um, services uh, prohibits the sale or promotion of those services to students and a particular function for TEXA in that respect is obtaining court orders to, um, to shut down online websites. Um, uh, so the enforcement of those new laws will be a, a key focus for uh, a, a new unit that's being established right now within TEXA called the Higher Education Integrity Unit uh, and that unit will also complement and strengthen, strengthen our existing work and interests in a range of integrity related issues such as admission standards and as Peter has pointed out, academic freedom. Um, my, focus, um, my focus will not be on duplicating or replicating the work of other government agencies and it will be to work with rather than against the sector in addressing some of these integrity threats such as cybersecurity, foreign interference and research integrity. So in conclusion, um, I think what I've attempted to do today is to outline through an approach that emphasizes risk, necessity and proportionality, the work that we've done through the course of 2020 to uh, address or reduce some of the regulatory burden on the sector and respond to the very real impacts of the, of the pandemic. Um, our focus has remained on uh, assuring the quality of the student experience in particular around online learning practices and studying the impacts of the switch to inform future quality assurance activities. And this work has, um, we think, supported Australian higher education through the pandemic and um, strengthened our response to emerging integrity risks as well. Um, as Peter has pointed out, and I think it's a very interesting area for discussion, uh, a real challenge for, for me and for Peter Coldrake um, in particular, once um, once he uh, assumes the role of um, of chief commissioner of, of Texa, is to adjust our regulatory response and model um, to the very rapid changes that are taking hold in the sector. In part driven by the pandemic, but, but which also represents sort of ongoing change, and that's been a real observation of mine in my short time in, in the role for the last three months. It's been that, if you like. Um, the timelines for things that were happening, micro-credentials, online learning, um, uh, the shift to blended learn, um, models, if you like, have been compressed by the, by the pandemic. It's really driven a lot of those um, changes that, are, that were already occurring um, in the sector and compressed timeframes from say five years to 18 months. Um, so that's been a very interesting um, observation that I've made and, and, um, uh, and it, and it poses challenges for the regulator as much as it does for the for the providers. In any case, Jim, I, um, I think I should finish there and, and I look very much look forward to the opportunity to address any questions or, or observations about my presentation. Thank you. Thanks very much, Alistair, for that uh, very, very uh, comprehensive presentation, but also uh, I'm encouraged by your commitment and, and ability to provide flexibility, the sensitivity 
in relation to relief packages, the expedited uh, accreditation, and, and your awareness of the regulatory burden and, and the need to work collaboratively with other regulators and, and of course providers. So thank you very much for that. It is a, it is a challenging role and it's good to see your um, uh, approach and collaborative approach that you, you're giving to it. And it's now an appropriate time to introduce uh, Arjun Serapani, who is the chief executive of ERT. And, and it's probably a good example of where the rubber hits the road and what here we have a uh, Victorian Institute of Technology actually trying to deliver on these uh, outcomes for, and as you can see from Arjun's uh, profile, a very impressive profile with 25 years experience uh, across a range of areas from business development, marketing and commercialization. And he has uh, kept VIT here since 1998 and that's, uh, that's a pretty good achievement in itself for a very successful private provider. So over to you, Arjun, for your um, comments and commentary, over to you. Arjun, you'll need to Thank unmute. You. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Jim, for the kind introduction. Good day to all. And very diff hard to say much after such two eminent speakers. And both Peter and Alistair have given real insight into the regulation and the year ahead, what we are looking. And unilaterally, we all agree that a national regulator and regulatory framework is very important to maintain the reputation of Australian higher education and protect the student interest. And a practical example of that is we offer online MBA in Middle East and North Africa. An Australian MBA is considered to be a superior product compared to Swiss or UK MBA because of Texas reputation internationally. It's thanks to Texas and it establishes that a strong regulatory framework and a national regulator is very important for the continued growth of the sector. Alicia, your appointment as the CEO of Texas is a welcome positive change. Your experience in the private, public, political, diplomatic and regulatory sectors brings in a wide ranging experience to the table and we look forward to working with you. And saying that, I will move on to the topic of the day and look at the mega trends or major trends or landscape of the higher education. And look at the big picture and try to join the dots. The next slide, please. This is a research paper from ISEF and if you look at the growth trajectory of the higher education since 2000, it's grown from nearly 100 million enrollments to 250 million in 2020 and projected to grow to 600 million by 2040. The most interesting fact of this data set is that 80% of the growth is going to come from Asia Pacific, Middle East and Africa. Most of them are existing markets for Australia and majority of these countries are in close proximity to Australia. The next slide please. And also in the last just one decade, the massive open online courses called MOOCs have grown from negligible or modest numbers to 110 million by 2019, not including the, the, the enrollments in China because they have their own MOOC platforms. And it is further rapid growth in 2020, where online education has become mainstream due to COVID-19 and the lockdowns. We expect another 20 million adding to the MOOCs just this year globally. So the, the first two slides establish the trajectory of the higher education in the past, current and present, the growth trajectory. The next slide, please. It's again a well-known story or well-known history that Australia by any means is a great success story in delivering international education. From free education delivered in the 1950s as part of Colombo plan and the major reforms started initiated in 1990 by the federal education minister, John Dawkins. And through the Howard era, the higher education has grown from strength to strength from a very humble beginnings of few thousand enrollments 
2019 has seen nearly 700,000 enrollments, you know, including all sectors in, in Australia. And the revenue, next slide please. Now, revenue has grown from few million back in 1987, 1990 to $5 billion in 2000 and $37.5 billion in 2019. Next please. And compared to this, uh, uh, just if you just focus on what's highlighted in yellow, these are the top 25 exports goods and services from Australia, totaling to in the financial year 2018-19, the total is $470 billion. 60% of that comes from resource exports. The interesting fact is again, the 50% of that $260 billion just comes from one state, Western Australia. It will be interesting to see whether Western Australia will continue to be part of Australian economy on a lighter note. So this certainly the data said, next slide please, establishes the growth trajectory of the higher education up to 2040 and beyond. Now, this is the time to ask ourselves, debate, question and ponder whether this success we have maintained, we have built over the past, can we manage and maintain in future? At the same time, can we continue 10x growth in resource sector? Can we really dig 10 times more? And can we address the climate change and global warming by digging 10 times more? We have no such problems with education export. And it's interesting also to note that Global average of college educated population is just 6.7%. We all are aware of the benefits of college education that brings econo economic benefits to the individuals and the developing nations. And the existing technology and the emerging technologies like the internet and the 5G and the open online, open online learning delivery and the MOOCs and the availability and the affordability of the mobile phone and tablets will continue the growth trajectory of the higher education and all education. And especially it will fuel the growth and hunger for knowledge. Then the subset from this data set is clearly established that there is an opportunity in the education revolution. And Australia from nowhere has become a very dominant player in international education delivery being the third third internationally after the US, Canada, and neck to neck with UK and Canada. And within our own exports, it's the third largest export internally. So can we grow 10X from 37 billion to 370 billion in the next 15, 20 years? The question is, is it possible, plausible, or probable? My opinion is, is it certainly prob probable? It's a matter of time. So the, what this sums up because I'm running out of time is, do we have the skill set? Yes, we have universities within the global 100 and 500 as per the QS 2019. And how can the regulators support this sustained growth to support the Australian economy and the community? The feedback we received from the sector is that, the next slide please. Is one of one of the major important factors is that does, does the growth come at a declining quality or improved quality? Some of the case studies we look at are uh, if the growth is well planned and underlying processes are robust, the rapid growth comes with rapid quality improvement. Some of the examples are Apple, Amazon, Alibaba, Tesla, and nation states like Singapore, Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, China. And in the education sector, edX, Coursera, Udemy, which have grown from negligible numbers to 110 million just over a span of one decade. The questions which are beyond my scope, which are for the panel and all the participants are, do we have the political will and the regulatory process and the mindset to support this growth from 10X, 37 billion to 370 billion over the coming two decades? That takes me to my concluding remark of what the regulator, how the regulator can support the sector. The, sec the feedback we have from the private providers, including the providers like me, is the implementation of a governing quality, governing quality principle of fit, per fit for purpose regulation. Staff representation with private sector experience to avoid bias. 
and as the higher education standards framework implementation requires interpretation and subject to individual perceptions. The federal government should support the regulator with extra funding to support this projected growth in the sector, to recruit additional staff of high quality at middle and junior level and reduce the staff turnover, and also to improve the current processing timelines to support the digit in the digital and knowledge economy and to retain Australia's place as a leader in the global knowledge economy and digital economy. Thanks once again for all of you for participating. Uh, that's, I'll conclude that, Jim. Thanks. Thanks uh, very much, uh, Arjun, for that, uh, 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 that very uh, comprehensive presentation. And also note the longevity of your organization as a private provider since 1998 and, uh, ch and challenging the question of whether we can grow 10x. And I think um, certainly from, uh, from the Queensland, I know that Trade Investment Queensland is very, very keen and proactive in pushing that and getting international education. And I can see similar trends in WA Victoria and New South Wales and South Australia as well. So I think we, your other comment that I think is worth all of us listening to is of course the uh, um, robust regulatory framework that, you've had, that you operate in and, and the need for extra funding for the government to see this very, very important and value-adding export industry. And on that, on, with, with that background, let me then uh, introduce uh, Dr. Michael Tomlinson, who is a higher education governance and quality uh, consultant who has also given advice to VIT as well. So over to you, Michael, and you can see from his, uh, from his profile that he in fact was a director of assurance at Tex Texa, and he's got extensive audit experience, uh, university experience, and uh, a person that really understands also the international side in, in relation to accreditation and, uh, and uh, is very well placed to talk to us today. So over to you, Dr. Michael. Thanks very much. Uh, so I think the question that's been posed by uh, Arjun is a very important one. We've had a, a, a very steep trajectory of growth over the past 10, 20 years in export education. There has been a pause because of the current uh, pandemic uh, situation. But after the pause, we would want that trajectory of growth to uh, resume. And the question is, how do we do that in a way which preserves quality? And it occurs to me that there are basically uh, two strategies that we can take as a nation and that providers can take. The way I put it in my addresses that I make to providers is we can either take the high road or we can take the low road. We can reduce our entry standards and go for volume above all else and not worry too much about the quality or we can maybe accept a little less volume but ensure that we preserve quality. And it's interesting to know, to, to, to consider how we would uh, go about doing that. Recently, I was uh, doing a keynote address for the Higher Education Providers Quality Network. And I reflected on my journey through the higher education sector from university management, at first at a group of eight university and then at a relatively new University of Technology, through to the regulatory agencies, first the Australian Universities Quality Agency and then TEXA, and now coming back to the other side of the fence, working with the providers uh, again. And I guess over the course of that journey, uh, I've come to the conclusion that the fundamental guarantor of, of uh, quality in our sector is uh, external peer review. This is the traditional uh, approach that the academic world has taken over centuries to maintaining academic uh, standards. And there are two ways in which uh, we can do that. We can do it from the perspective of, of, of Texa, and we can also do it within our own uh, institutions, two ways. And firstly, uh, 
we can, and I always recommend to all of my the providers that I work with that they engage in a peer review of assessment exercises. So the absolutely critical aspects of maintaining academic standards are entry standards and exit standards. If you maintain your entry standards by choosing students who have the capacity to succeed, and if you then assess them rigorously to ensure that when they graduate, they actually have achieved the learning outcomes of their courses. This is about 70% of the job of maintaining, uh, maintaining quality. The other very important thing, we, we, the very important bulwark we have in our sector protecting quality, of course, are the academic boards. I'm a member of Arjun's academic board at BIT. Uh, corporate boards are also important, but when it comes to academic standards, uh, the academic boards are, are particularly important. And they have a very important role in maintaining quality. And the way I often put this is that uh, they can be like an internal watchdog over quality inside the organization. They're composed of people who have uh, a lot of experience in higher education, either on the managerial side like me or on the academic side. And the, the essence of it is that <clears throat> proposals that come forward, academic proposals that come forward, can be uh, given active scrutiny and, and under a, a, a large number of, uh, from a large number of perspectives, rather than from the perspective only of whoever is the proponent and has a vested interest, obviously, in putting a, a proposal forward. So we can maintain that uh, level of quality. We can, those of us who are sitting on academic boards can. Uh, scrutinize a proposal that comes up and consider uh, whether it does in fact meet, meet the expectations for academic standards in the higher education standards uh, framework. And it behoves all of us to think about how to do that. It's very easy to sit on a board, either on an academic board or a corporate, corporate board. People come along, they give us, uh, they introduce various uh, papers, they speak very plausibly about, about what they're doing. And it would be easy to sit back and just accept that passively. But as I often say, uh, one of the first duties of a board member is to ask dumb questions. Why are we doing it this way? Normally, I would expect us to be doing that a different way. How come we are doing it this way? And if, all the, uh, if, if the proposals are given that kind of scrutiny, they will uh, they'll most probably be uh, more robustly achieve their uh, Objectives. The other aspect of the work of the uh, academic boards that's very prominent in the higher education standards framework, apart from the traditional role of course approvals and approval of academic policy, is monitoring uh, <coughs> student experience data. And this is something that we need to work out how to do in the best possible uh, way. I uh, recently was talking with a provider that was helping them uh, in this area and somebody asked me, can you give us a model? Can you suggest where we can go to to see a really good model of an institution that's reporting its uh, academic uh, student data upwards in a way that's very effective? And it was an interesting question and it actually uh, it brought me to a standstill for a moment because I couldn't actually think of a, a provider that does it particularly well in a way that information is presented to the governance bodies that is pertinent, that is relevant, that enables them to get a real grasp of what is happening. Uh, and at the level of aggregation of detail that is appropriate for a board, management of particular areas will go deep down into the detail. People at, uh, in Peter's level need to have a much more aggregated picture and getting the mix right between detail and the big picture is not easy. Every board is only as good as the information that it gets and the questions that it asks about that uh, information. So I think looking back over my career, what are the risks, major risks to quality that I've seen in all the different providers that I've uh, audited or visited or worked in? They are mainly the, so what I refer to as the entrepreneurial risks and are the risks that you will cut corners as you pursue greater revenue and greater student growth. And I've seen this happen, not only in for-profit providers, but also in not-for-profit providers. So we, we, we want to pursue growth in a way 
doesn't cut any corners. And the providers that I work with are generally very committed uh, to doing exactly that. So on that note, I think I will finish uh, my contribution and pass it back to you, Jim. Thank, thanks, thanks very much for that, uh, Michael, and, uh, and for reminding us of the importance of external peer review, the entry standards, the visa standards, the, the importance of academic boards, the monitoring of uh, the student experience, and of course, getting that mix right, and then also your uh, work with the entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship and risk management. And that's a, a good note on which to introduce our uh, next speaker, who is Dr. Partha Mukherjee, who is also the AIBC National Industry Chair in Education and Training. And you can see uh, here on the Education, Skills and Development Industry chapter that uh, Partha has a, a long and distinguished career in international and uh, professional career for 40 years. In fact, he runs his own RTO. And uh, he's been very active with the Australian Indian Business Council in promoting education and skills development. And he's had that experience of being a panel as well and been an advisor to several education providers in, in Australia and Australian businesses. So with, with that background, uh, Partha, you're the good timing for you to, to share with us your perspective. Over to you. Thank you, Jim. Uh, good afternoon. India and good evening, Australia. I can see more than 100 at any point of time has been participating in this webinar, which means the topic is very contemporary and very interesting. So the previous uh, eminent speakers have already taken us through the regulatory importance for quality and reputation of the Australian education. And therefore I will probably digress a little bit and bring in another dimension which I have put my presentation heading as how the higher education sector can facilitate the economy and the community through innovation. And when I say facilitation, obviously it needs the participation of universities. It needs the facilitation of the government the regulator, and most important, the industry, for the recipient or the benefit realization is done through the industry sector. So I expected that we'll go over time and therefore I have limited my part of sharing my thoughts to three quick innovation areas and then maybe one or two uh, extra points which is on more on the operational areas. So therefore, the first part of my presentation, which is more on the vision, a painting a vision of what could be the innovation that will facilitate economic growth and also bring in the benefits to the community. And the first topic is basically what Peter has already touched upon. And I think every single education, higher education sector seminars I go or participate or speak it comes out and that is a simple word called research. So I'm going to talk about what research innovation that could be brought in and why. Now, traditionally we know the research piece of higher education is essentially between university to university or collaboration between the professors or the academic between the two universities. And that's what I call is also research mindset because why also research? Because they don't do 100% research. The professors are busy delivering academic uh, curriculum. They are having extra loads on administration and then they do also research. But we, we know for sure from the experience of the other industry that the research delivers the best when it is dedicated it is collaborative and it is focused. Simple examples of that could be from Silicon Valley, where the best of the technology startups start from Silicon Valley because it's dedicated, it's collaborative and it's focused. The other example could be Hollywood, the center of excellence, if I may say so. So I think the innovative thought on research, which I would like to bring here is to create center of excellence or other words, research campuses. 
the campuses were 100% dedicated to research where it could be shaped through the facilitation of, as I mentioned, through not one university, but multiple universities pitching in for an innovation center of the research campus where government could do whatever they could from policy, funding, and other perspective. A regulator plays a very important role because the quality of such research, the benchmark has to be set at the very highest level because we don't want to be only good in Australian standard, but probably in the global standards. And then industry, of course, who either sponsors those research or gets the benefit. So this is my first th thought. And the most important of this thought will also be the alignment with the country specific priorities. For example, if we are collaborating with say India and Australia, in that case, we need to see where the, the two governments are currently aligning. It could be in the defense, it could be in technology, it could be in medicine, it could be in manufacturing, or it could be in pure science, or it could be the earth science, or it could be in agriculture. It's very important that the research campus is aligned with the country specific priorities because then the entire synergy will be realized very soon. So that's my first thought on how innovation can play through the higher education sector in terms of bringing in more economic benefit and benefit to the community. My second point is similar, but a little different, which is how do we boost the innovation, boost the economy through the innovation and most important acceleration of that innovation. Now, as we know, whether it was mobile technology or whether it is uh, you know, advanced medicines, it all starts with a research center and then commercialization of that is basically comes from the scientists and the technologies who work in that area to make it affordable and which could be disseminated to the society. So therefore, it is important for us to also keep that in mind that how do we boost the economy through innovation and scientists and academics can help. Now I'll give the example, <clears throat> quick example one or two. For example, the next decade is going to be the decade of intelligent chips. We know for sure already people are working that very soon the building blocks and really I mean, mean the building blocks like materials like bricks and all will be replaced by the intelligent chips. We'll be sitting in a in our desk where it will not be wooden desk, it will be all chip based desk. We'll be sitting at a home in the evening to watch television, but there'll be no television because my walls will be intelligent chip based wall, which can actually project uh, television and uh, uh, you know, images, if I may say so. Uh, every morning I'll be going to the toilet and my toilet will be basically off of chips. Why? Because the sensors and the chips can actually cr create the data that is needed for showcasing or showing me how I'm doing in terms of my health every day morning you know, what I have done the previous day and, you know, the next day morning in my, my toilet bowl will actually give that in my smartphone. And that will actually take us to a completely different life because these are coming. These are not ideas anymore because this is actually happening. Only the commercialization part of that has, hasn't happened as yet. So I can see that there is a possibility for accelerating those innovation through the collaboration of different universities and the science and technologies in those universities to bring it quick, quicker and faster, which will help in terms of both the economy and the community. And regulator and governments and industry will definitely play a very important part the third point which I want to bring in is basically the student's experience, because it's very important that whatever we do at the end, the students should enjoy. And not only they should tick the box of the education part, but the peripheral 
part also needs to be ticked. So I'll bring in two facts to establish the reason why I'm bringing in these innovative thoughts. The fact number one, in my 40 years of career, both in the private sector, the government sector, and also being over 30 years in the universities, in the teaching sector, I've interacted with thousands of students. The students who are coming from the international countries to Australia, one thing they always tell me that one of the objective of their coming to Australia is that while they're studying, they would like to also see and experience the country, Australia. So it's very important box that they need to take before they go back to their home country or whatever they want to do later in life that along with studies, they will also experience the country. And the fact number two, that is from the government of Australia's perspective that the government wants international students to also be in the countries of the regional locations. Now blending these two requirements, the thought which I'm presenting is there, is there a possibility to explore therefore delivering say a master's course of four semester in not one university or one location, but four semester in four universities and four campuses in four locations. They can start probably with a city campus or one university, then go to a peripheral city, and then they can go to probably a regional university, which means we are talking about strategic alliance like any other product or services in the world to bring into the education thought process that can the universities have strategic alliances and then create an additional program as a trial initially. And that additional program has the blessing of the government, the blessing and also quality checked by the regulator supported by the industry in terms of when the students actually move from university to university, location to location. The industry like Coles and Woolworths are there everywhere. So they can provide continuity in terms of the work integrated learning. And therefore what will happen is we are actually completely changing the experience which will attract more enrollment, which will bring in more economic benefits and the start could be very simply from a domestic exchange program in, instead of an international exchange program. And while the program has been incubated by say four university, universities to start with, the exchange programs between the four universities can really facilitate and take them up to the learning curve. So I will stop here with the three ideas, but I've got three quick ideas where I thought it will be important for me to share because Alistair is here. Uh, these are various point of time, various academics actually told me and I thought uh, in a couple of minutes, I should be able to share those thoughts. One of the thought uh, Alistair is uh, the compliance for domestic and international should be not exactly same because international compliance for the people who are delivering in overseas campuses needs to be regulated differently because the alignment of those country educational requirement and working with those regulators are highly important for us to be seen as international collaborators, even in the regulatory scenario. So this is one thought, whether there could be a segregation or a little bit of separation from domestic compliance and international compliance. The second thought is in terms of the students who have been talking to us, and there are hundreds of them, they always say, what are the best source of authentic information for future students? And one of the areas could be led by TEXA because TEXA has got the right pulse, has got the right knowledge through their audit process about what's happening in the industry and whether there's a possibility for a generalized public information on the quality of education delivery, which could be easily shared for the future students. And I think that will be fantastic for the students because it comes with the credibility of TEXA. And the last but not the least is a thought on the 
audit part where the academics are delivered by in-house academics and also very, very senior adjunct faculties. The adjunct faculties are the bees, are like the bees who travel from one flower to the another flower and get the best of everything. And therefore, there is a possibility of very senior and seasoned and experienced adjunct faculties to be brought in for knowing the best practices and knowing also what's happening in the industry, what are the challenges. And I thought they will bring in independent, valuable insights with no bias, and there will be a fantastic reference group to TEXA if they could be included in some way. So my list is long, but I'll keep thoughts for some other time and other days, but I think I will end here today and go for the question answer session now. Thank you, time is well and truly up. So can I ask uh, our um, Alastair the first question, how does the Texa balance its role between promoting the sector and being the regulator? How would you sum that up? Alastair? Yes, I'm just unmuting myself. Um, <laughs> okay. um, uh, well, that's always a tension, isn't it, in the role of the regulator, um, mm. uh, promoting the sector whilst at the same time um, maintaining a, a, a detachment, if you like, or uh, and, and 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 our independence from the sector and from the government of the day in regulating. Mm. So um, that that is that is a uh, inherent. Yeah in the role of the regulator and that's one that um it's, it's just there as, as, as something that we always have to try and manage mm. thanks for that peter verghese uh, any comment you'd like to make on the same question um well i i very much share alistair's view that it is a it, it is a delicate balance uh i mean I, i'd go back to the point of quality being at the center of a shared interest between institutions and regulators and to the extent that uh, the regulator is doing its job to enforce quality and standards, they will be promoting the sector. So I, th I think you can find ways where uh, both of those objectives can, uh, can be served effectively. But um, as with most other things, it's going to take judgment on how you do it in particular areas. Mm. So Arjun Surapani, you you're of course at the uh, you know yeah, at the you. where the rubber hits the road on this one. Any thanks, comments thanks. on that question? Yeah, I don't want to say too much because we are at the receiving end. But however, <laughs> it is a difficult act, as Peter and Alistair have said. But however, it's very important to maintain the reputation for us to grow. Thanks. And uh, uh, Dr. Tomlinson, you have you've got all that experience, Michael. Uh, what would your comment be on that? Yeah, I wouldn't see it as part of the role of the regulator to promote the sector directly, but it would uh, it, it would <clears throat> promote it indirectly by maintaining its reputation for quality. That would be the contribution the regulator would make. And uh, perhaps that goes a little bit also to Pata's question, uh, first question about um, making a distinction between, as I read it, your question the um, onshore and offshore offerings of Australian providers. Mm. A very important consideration there is um, uh, what we're doing here is part of our role is to maintain and enhance the reputation of the Australian provider and, and the student experience from, from the offerings of those providers. So I think we would have to be very cautious before making a distinction between uh, the regulation of um, of an offshore offering by an Australian um, provider, who, after all, presumably would be marketing themselves as as um, as, uh, as Australian and subject to um, Australian standards and and um, and to the regulatory practices of Texa. So, I understand your point, but I think that's that's would need to be a consideration in 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 in, in, in um, making any kind of judgment about those kinds of distinctions. So Peter Verghese, your comment on that? 
Well, look, I, I would be at the highly sceptical end of um, having different standards for domestic and international, uh, largely because I would see that as a slippery slope, um, which is not in the interests of uh, the sector and not in the interests of Australia maintaining a reputation for high quality. Now, um, you know, whether, whether that's kind of an overly defensive approach, um, um, you could argue, uh, but I, I would be uh, very, very wary of starting down that path. Thanks for that, Peter. And what a, and what a good time to now wrap up this really very, uh, very, very um, comprehensive and insightful webinar. And I'd like to now call on Amritha Zakaria, who is the uh, ARBC Queensland Education Chapter Rep, to deliver a word of thanks. And if you see Amritha's uh, profile there, she's a business leader with uh, extensive consulting experience, and she's very familiar with the um, education sector across Queensland in a role at Gartner. And she's, um, and, and those who meet Amritha would tell you that she's very passionate about making a difference to enable business leaders to achieve business priorities. So over to you, Amritha, and congratulations also on your uh, election to the Management uh, Committee and Treasury of uh, ARBC Queensland chapter. Over to you. Thank you, Jim. That's much appreciated. Wow, I'm in um, such great company <laughs> right now. <laughs> it's just a little bit intimidating. Um, so what a fabulous conversation. I think there were so many great points that came out in terms of what the future looks like, the structural change, is there going to be a structural change as a result of all the acceleration that's taking place um, online? What, what is that going to look like and the role of the regulator, that delicate balancing act? So there's so much there in terms of what I've heard today. And I suppose looking to the future, it's, it's about the students and that lifelong learning and you know the different demographics that have the needs. So huge thank you to everyone today. Um, before we wrap up, I just want to say uh, we couldn't have done this session without our sponsors, the Victorian Institute of Technology, and uh, without their support, this wouldn't have been possible. A huge thank you to our Queensland and National Secretariats. Um, we have, um, can you go to the next slide? Um, Kritika Bansell and Wendy Farrell, uh, um, they have just been working late hours pulling this together. So huge thank you to them. Vishal, you've been managing the technology and it's gone so smoothly. So well done, thank you. Um, now special thanks to our education chapter committee, the Queensland uh, AIBC president and the education chapter members. Go to the next slide. Um, huge thank you to our esteemed speakers, panelists, uh, partners, and guests. And of course, you know, the audience today, um, hope you, everyone got some value out of it. We've got another webinar coming up. If you haven't already registered to the healthcare webinar tomorrow, it's not too late. So just a quick um, shout out for that. It's on shaping the future of clinical trials. So I'll give it back to Jim. Thank Thanks you. very much for that, Amrith. And I'd like to uh, conclude the session by asking each of our uh, panelists just to give me three words, no sentences, just three words on what this webinar meant for you and, and its meaning and how you describe it. So um, let, let me start with Peter Vergates. What three words would you use to describe uh, what you wanted to say in this webinar and what you've heard? Well, I'll actually steal Michael's words and there's four rather than three, which is follow yeah, the high fine. road. Follow mm -hmm. the high road. Follow the high road. Excellent. <laughs> and Alistair McLean, your three words or four words, if you wish. Oh, uh, learning, exposure, uh, difference. Hmm. Very good. Uh, Arjun, your three words. I'll say growth and uh, balance between quality and growth. Right. Uh, Michael Tomlinson, your three mine, words. Mine are very similar. Entrepreneurship, quality, and risk. Balancing mm -hmm. arms. Partha Mukherjee, your three words. Yeah, mine is two. One is engaging, another is exciting. <laughs> right. Nick Sanapathy, your three words. Nick? Yep. 
I think I'll steal from uh, Peter and say uh, quality, postgraduate research, and collaboration. Okay, that's very good. Amritha, your three words? I'd say look to the future. Oh, that's four words. That's fine. And, 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 and my three, three words would be collaboration, determination, standards, different. And on that note, at exactly 5.15, can I thank all our speakers again and, uh, and all our participants, all questions that have not been answered, and there are many of them, we will be following it through. And thank you all for your attendance. And we look forward for our next web webinar with all of you. And thanks particularly to our speakers today to taking the time to address this very, very important issue. So from me, it's uh, namaste, namaskaram, uh, and good evening this time to all, all, both India and Australia. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks all.